Welcome to Democratic Television, a program of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party that brings insights, perspectives, and attitudes of our always thoughtful Democratic guests. Our focus today is on state government and elections, and our guest is Josh Becker. He's a candidate for State Senate District 13. Welcome, Josh. Thank you for coming and joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, uh, in the beginning of our show, we often like to ask our guests what uh, a bit about themselves and the, the, their background and their personal life that maybe brought them to the place of, of public service. Um, were you born in the Bay Area, or like many of us, did you come here from somewhere else? Yes, I came here from uh, Philadelphia. Fabulous. That's where I was born. Mm. Yeah. And what really got me into public service was an experience I had out of college. I was working at a consulting job, um, it was environmental consulting, I was in DC, but I got to wear a suit, I was commuting on the metro, right. a job my parents could be proud of, mm -hmm. and I left it to go down to Central America. It was in the early 90s, so we had a, it was a war zone. I went down to work with refugees in Guatemala, and ultimately started a school for kids in El Salvador. Mm. And it was that intense experience that really transformed me. and and. Uh, led me to lead my uh, and devote my life to service. So that um, uh, I went to law school and uh, I've had friends who were very interested in the environment, and, and a good number of them went into uh, environmental law. And that meant a lot of different things to different people. Some of them essentially went to law firms and were working kind of like for what some environmentalists might call polluters, and they didn't really feel that good about that in the end. Others kind of went to government or nonprofit organizations. Uh, in, in your work, did you feel like you were uh, doing positive work as a consultant uh, in, uh, for environmental businesses, or was that something that was a stress for you or, or a question for you? Yeah, well, this, so this was out of college. We were actually, it, it, it was good work, and we were mm -hmm. working, we were consultants for EPA yeah. um, on things like the Oil Pollution good. Act. So yeah. we were actually writing the rules and regulations. Fabulous. Once Congress had passed in 1990, the Oil Pollution mm -hmm. Act. Uh, we were also working with DOD in cleaning up Superfund I sites. Yeah. That was a big part of our work. Now, um, that kind of work for many uh, young people leads to a career in government, sort of being in and out of administrations and really being D.C.-based. And it sounds like you may have been on that path. So what, 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 what drew you away from that to go down to Central America? Just did you become aware of issues there and, and have concern for that? Or? Yeah, well, I was a major in international relations was one of my mm -hmm. focuses. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was hard not to be aware of what was happening in the early 90s, right. what the Reagan administration was yes. doing. Supporting right-wing militias. Right, in it was Central a time America. of, of, of uh, American foreign policy was contributing in an unhelpful way to exactly. life for people in Central America. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I did, you know, when I came back, that determined me to get even more involved in in D.C. Actually, so right. uh, I went to work on campaigns. Mm. I w volunteered for women f from my district when I was growing up, and it was the solidly Republican Republican when I was growing up. Right. And she ran to be the first Democrat in 116 years. Wow. That's from that something. district. Wow. And just like the area that I'm representing now, we used to rep you know, we used to have moderate Republicans. So we right. had kind of moderate Republicans when such things existed. Yes, it's the history we try to, to, to forget. Uh, but uh, well, but we're yeah, all I, Democratic now, but we did have that time when we were a mix of Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, and again, there were some good people, Pete McCloskey and yeah. folks like that. Mm -hmm. Senator but, Morgan. And yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. And But when she was um, uh, elected as the first Democrat in 116 years, I uh, went to work on some other campaigns, and I came back as her press secretary. I see. And... Um, I got to see at that level, get really involved and see how policy right. was made. Yeah. But then what brought me out here, like you, I uh, went to Stanford uh, Law School. Fabulous, yes. And Great school. so coming out to, to Stanford for law school mm -hmm. and then also business school where I could also get a, a certificate in public management, that's really what brought me out here. Wow, good. Good. So, uh, have you always been a Democrat? I grew up in Detroit, as you may know, and uh, you know, union family, and uh, was just born into a Democratic family. I didn't have to kind of find my way. Were, were your family Democrats, and has that always been your orientation? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, same thing. My right. grandmother was part of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, wow, something, you know, kind yeah. of a legendary yes. yeah. union. And my mom was involved as well. She was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. She was part of the group that voted in the teachers' union in Philadelphia. She that told is. me in 1965. Wow. And yeah. then later, social worker and part of AFSCME. So, mm -hmm. but the joke is, it was so Republican. The joke was, my dad was the Democratic ward leader for two years and didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> there was yeah. not a lot of organized right. um, 
you know, democratic uh, yeah. uh, infrastructure there. But yes. Yes, interesting. Um, I'm curious about uh, being a, a native of Philadelphia. Do you have perspectives on Pennsylvania politics? It's become kind of an important state, obviously, in the yeah. national picture. And it seems like governors and, and U.S. senators from the state have flipped back and forth. And I know, like Michigan, there's sort of like in Michigan, there's Detroit, and then there's everything else. Um, and and many Democrats live in Detroit and Detroit's environs, and there's it's much more Republican uh, beyond that. Is Pennsylvania similar, and is it changing in, in, in a way that we Democrats should be happy about or, or concerned about? Well, it's certainly a, a swing state right now, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And. Democrats have work to do. I went I went back to Canvas for Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and really working on the suburbs. And that group, that area has become more democratic and was pretty democratic when voting for Hillary. Mm -hmm. But I did go out to some other areas outside of Philadelphia and around Ben Salem. And I had uh, another meeting there. Mm -hmm. And I saw Trump signs. That's when I first time, this was October right. of 2016. So this is the first time I started to get a little bit yes. concerned. I saw a fair amount of. Mm. Um, Trump Penn signs there, so it, it it really is a swing state, and mm. we need someone, um, you know, at the top of the ticket that is going to have um, you know an inclusive message and be able to rally the Democratic base, but also reach out across the state. Right. Yeah, I think that is the uh, that is the, the the key to success in 2020. Mm. Uh, remembering Connor Lamb's success in a district that yeah. was just being flipped, Good and point. Uh, yeah. and you know he had an interesting. Um, perspective because obviously I think he had to have some moderate positions to be able to be successful in that district but he was also very much supported by local labor unions and so mm -hmm. there does seem to be um, a, a democratic coalition that can be built uh, even in some of the places outside of the bigger, bigger right, cities. Right, that has strongly Republican registration and, right. and he won that seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's a, it's a lesson. Well, good. So um, uh, California is amazing. So it sounds like, like me, you ended up in the uh, being retained here by the gravitational pull of Stanford in, in, yeah. in, in part. And I know uh, you've done work in law and business in the area, a lot of innovation, and, and uh, with some focus um, uh, on uh, sort of uh, socially relevant uh, and, mm -hmm. and positive uh, enterprises. How, how, what balance have you struck and, and um, you know, what kind of experiences in that regard uh, do you think are rele relevant to your public life? Yeah, well, it's really been fun because I've got to be in the forefront of a number of areas, including clean energy, mm -hmm. innovation. So I was involved with uh, the first project at, to zero zero money down solar. Wow. And eventually, you had, really originally you had to buy it all up front. And we said, hey, great, let's let people lease this over yes. time. Yeah, there'd be this value proposition, but it'd be, well, wait a minute. If I don't get paid off for years and years and years. And you know, the, it, it's rational to make that choice if you have the finances to do it, but it's much harder to sell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, other innovations, you know, energy efficiency innovations. We took over the utility bill and used behavioral psychology to compare people to their neighbors. Say, hey, wow. here's how much you could save if you were just doing what your most efficient neighbors were doing. Right. And and that proved to be very effective and widely adopted across the state and across the country. Wow. And um, showed that we could significantly reduce energy bills just by doing that uh, across millions of customers. Mm -hmm. um, the first uh, PACE loan, so PACE was uh, property says clean energy mortgage. So essentially a way of letting people do energy efficiency, renewable energy, home energy retrofits, and attach it to their home loan. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved in a lot of really innovative efforts about how do we expand uh, clean energy, both from a nonprofit side and, a, and, and from a company side. Yeah. Um, we supported grid alternatives, mm -hmm. which putting solar panels up in low-income homes like East Palo Alto, where I've got an event right after this, mm -hmm. is now, now we supported that early on, and now that's become the nation's leading nonprofit solar installer. Right. So a lot of innovation there. But yes, in the legal side as well, even today I run a kind of a legal tech accelerator. So I have nine companies mm -hmm. uh, right now, and they're doing really fascinating work for, around access to justice, many of them. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is a platform called JDO. So it lets um, women or men who want to report harassment and be able to have a very detailed account on that is then taken, and they can either keep it private, um, they can get referred to a lawyer if they want, mm -hmm. um, but then they have a lot of privacy around this, but there's a matching algorithm, so if someone else rep reports the same harasser, then mm -hmm. they can get connected. So it's a really powerful platform. So what's the model that drives that, just from a business perspective? Does somebody need to make a little money to be able to get investment in that kind of a solution? Yeah, or so is it mostly do-gooders? And, and some are you know, for-profit social ventures. So in that case, they get referral fees. So if you choose to be connected right. um, to a lawyer, then they get they get referral fees. I see. So um, that's the way in that case where they can, they can hopefully build a sustainable 
I see. Uh, business. Well, I'll ask you one uh, uh, recently relevant question um, about the, the utilities. It's interesting the financing options to uh, help people install solar, and then it seems like that as we in California commit ourselves to zero emissions um, in in the relatively near future. Experts seem to think that a combination of the distributed um, solar and other generation, clean generation, and some large-scale generation is necessary, and that raises the question about how to get investment and financing for all of that work, which is a problem, of course, you'd face in the state senate as well. Uh, do do you see, you know, innovations as making that more possible, or is it just the need uh, to make those investments so great that 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 there will be financing and the government will have to support that? Sure. Well, this is a big part of why I'm running. Mm. I have the background of the networks to be the progressive um, environmental and climate change leader mm -hmm. in the state Senate, and I'm committed to, mm -hmm. uh, to doing that. And um, I was involved in SB 100, so this was our initiative we got passed in the state Senate and the state legislature to have 100, a standard now for 100% clean energy uh, by 2045. Now, I hope we can actually get there even so even faster right. than that. But it's great to have that out there as a benchmark. As you know, we went from 15% renewable energy to 20%. We had a 30% standard, 50%. In this bill, we raised that to 60% renewable energy. Mm. So it's really going to be taking all of the above a program. And that's the background that I have. It's mm -hmm. going to be everything from, uh, from uh, we've done a good job of electrifying our grid. Right. Now we have to plug our transportation sector into yes. that grid. Yes. We need to do more around clean energy, including things like uh, clean air, like the two-stroke motors for leaf blowers. And right. The background, yes. Or that's a lawnmower. Right. They're awful. Um, our work that we can do in our ag sector right. and ways to sequester carbon mm -hmm. through farming practices, um, things that we can do through supporting clean energy innovation and energy storage. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. I have a six-point plan around this that uh, goes into detail in each of those points. Now, energy, storage is, take. energy storage is another example where it's going to require some investment in the kind of infrastructure that will, will solve that and let us be completely um, uh, green. And um, and I think your background in finance, it sounds like, might be a, a good Yeah. Uh, well, what we need to do is set the public policy, set the clear direction, and then private markets will react, and they already are reacting around energy storage. But we need to set clear direction at the state level um, about uh, what we need, what the transformation that has to happen. Yes, I agree. Very good. Well, uh, thank you for the work that uh, you've been doing um, uh, in that area, and yeah. uh, we'll um, uh, have a chance in our second half to talk a little bit more about your campaign for state senate and about uh, your your plans and what you'd like to do uh, as an office holder. So, thank you very much. Great. Hello. My name is Cindy Chavez, and I have been um, active in the Democratic Party for many years. And the thing I would say to all of you who are watching this is sometimes the problems seem bigger than we can handle. But if you get involved, we can make great change. If you'd like to get involved with the Democratic Party, call 408-445-9500. If you're interested in some of the big issues of the day and you want to get more information, go to the website at sccdp.org. Don't let another day go by just wishing you could do something. Take action. Call. Thank you. We're back for the second half of our show with California State Senate District 13 candidate Josh Becker. Uh, Josh, thanks for our conversation so far. Uh, I wanted to, uh, we talked a bit about clean energy. Are there other areas of a kind of social innovation that you've been engaged in that you'd like to mention you think might be relevant to um, uh, your work in the Senate or of interest to, to viewers? Sure. Well, about 19 years ago, I started something called the Full Circle Fund. Mm -hmm. And this is a nonprofit that leverages the brain power of individuals here in the Bay Area to work across the region and do grants to nonprofits of both uh, money, but also teams of people to work with these nonprofits mm -hmm. in four areas in uh, housing and economic opportunity, in education, environment, and health. Mm -hmm. And for that work, I won the Jefferson Award. That's why I have this pin, which is a, uh, uh, a community and public service award started by Jackie Kennedy and Nassus and others wow. many years ago. Yeah. So wow. those are the areas. I started that group with those areas because they're areas I'm very interested in. Right. And those are the same areas that today I, I really want to 
focus on in the state senate. Right. Um, with the one addition of probably of transportation as something. Right. It's a little bit related to housing and the environment. Yeah. It's all kind of one picture, I think. Well, those are interesting areas. And I've got to say that in my work with young people, they're the areas uh, with uh, slightly different labels that are meant to impart urgency that uh -huh. I hear most about from young people in yeah. terms of what their concerns are and what they're mm -hmm. facing. Good. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, and what work, uh, what's like a, a, an example of the work that's come, been supported by the Full Circle Fund that you're proud of? Is there, are, yeah. are there particular standouts? I know you wouldn't want to fail to mention somebody, uh, but uh, are there a couple examples? Remember, but for example, Downtown Streets Team. Yeah. Downtown Streets Team started in Palo Alto um, as an effort to give the homeless population digni dignity, jobs, um, with a lot of supportive services around it. Right. It's now expanded into 15 cities in the Bay Area because mm -hmm. it's been so effective. Mm -hmm. and they've gotten almost 1,000 people into homes wow. and almost 1,000 people into permanent jobs. Wow, great. Uh, and I recently did rappelling down the, the tallest building is, you know, to raise money. Uh, Have you in, done it? In San Jose. Yeah, oh, I did wow, that. The first time the year, year and I did this past year as wow. well. Wow. Yeah. Um, which, was, which was fun, a little scary. Wow. Yeah, a little scary, I'm sure. Yeah, and um, that's my commitment. That's what I'm willing to do for right. that. Right, okay, good. <laughs> um, but, you know, groups like Great Alternative, which I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and New Teacher Center. So mm. one of the issues with teaching in California, we're, we were losing about 40% of our teachers within the first two years. Right. This is a very difficult profession. Mm -hmm. So New Teacher Center came up with an excellent teacher training and mentoring model. And in parts of our district, um, it's increased new teacher retention uh, 35%. Right. So an education, just as a, a prospective state policymaker, yeah. it seems like, uh, uh, you know, I know you and I both have kids and have had the benefit of going to uh, to kind of reasonably well-resourced suburban public schools. And the question is, what about all the other kids? We have such a big student population in California. Yeah. And to me, it's it's um, an inexplicable embarrassment to be so low on the per pupil spending uh, by state scale. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so many kids, it seems it would take a lot of money to meaningfully change that. Um, you know, where, where would one start? Is it is it something like public and private partnerships, like the ones you've been working on, uh, or is it just more we have to buckle down and make a bigger investment? Yeah, it, well, you know, we've inequality even in the Bay Area. We have school districts in San Mateo County, right some next that are to each other, funding right? at twenty thousand dollars a student, yeah. some funding at closer to ten thousand dollars a student. Right. So, um, I think that's 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 just a. Uh, uh, something that something has to, to be addressed, yeah. right? And it's resources, yeah. I think, because the, in the in the suburban districts, I think they're achieving good results because they they through parent activism and donations and high property values, they're able to fund the schools at a somewhat higher level. And then certainly, um, and then the kids in the, the the less successful districts, you know, they have a lot of needs, and so the cost is is high. So one of the hard things about being a teacher is how little they get paid, and it's such a beautiful place to live in California that it's expensive. Right. It's one of my dreams. I want teachers to be able to afford homes near right. the schools that they that yes. they that they serve. Mm -hmm. um, but I had an op-ed with Joe Ross in the um, San Mateo Daily Journal recently called Reclaiming Education Dollars. Mm -hmm. There's there's things we need to work on. There's actually forty five million dollars uh, between San Mateo County, Santa Clara County that um, should be staying in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, it's considered excess property tax. Right. But it's actually since twenty twelve is getting swept up by the state to pay for this state court system. I see. Believe it or not. Right. Right. So that's an example. So that's forty five million dollars a year we could great use to create an equity fund. Mm -hmm. We could use it for teacher housing because again right. that we have that money because of rising uh, property now how does values. something like that happen in Sacramento? And what are you going to do about it as a state senator? And I don't mean to be put it to you that way, but how does that happen? Is it that yeah. there's a tough budget year and the courts say we're going to not be able to do what we need to do unless you find us a few more dollars and someone thinks that that's a solution? Or? Yeah, I mean, there's just a tweak in, in 2012. It just mm -hmm. said, hey, these excess property taxes at the county level mm -hmm. get swept up for this. So we just need to, uh, someone just needs to change that and change that back down. Right. Um, so there's things that we can do. We need investments at all level. I'm a, I'm a county commissioner mm -hmm. and for the Child Care uh, Partnerships Council. Mm -hmm. So I work a lot on child care and early learning. Mm -hmm. That's a big focus of mine. We know we have to invest more in early learning. Oklahoma, for example, a red right. state, has universal preschool. Mm -hmm. We do not have right. that here. I'm working with the, the governor. I've been endorsed by Governor Newsom, and I've been um, working with the governor and very uh, happy about his investments in early childhood education, but that's an area we need to do more. In higher education, I teach in our community colleges mm -hmm. uh, here in our district, but i also been involved throughout the state. I was a founding trustee of UC Merced because that's a kind of big strategic bet mm -hmm. we need to make as a state. They said, hey, that's the lowest college attendance rate, poorest part of the state, let's build a UC and build a world-class research university there 
and it's happening. It's thriving tremendously. And we need to do one of the more issues of that. that I hear about from young people, and I think that the um, uh, st the information uh, about like debt load, consumer debt, be bears oh, yeah. us out, is the the significant contribution to increasing consumer debt of student loan debt. Yeah. And that seems kind of like a crime. I mean, the, all debt has gone up. The, of course, overall consumer debt has gone up quite a bit. But the largest rate of growth and the big giant chunk of that is um, is student loan debt. Um, and what would you think would be the right balance between you know students and their families kind of having some commitment uh, financially to the, what they're undertaking, but not really being burdened for the rest of their lives by, by heavy student debt? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have a plan to triple student aid in, mm -hmm. in this state. It's something that we, we need to do. My parents, my grandparents were immigrants. And my parents went to public university, both went to Temple University mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, virtually for free. Right. Um, and it's really only in the last, you know, 20, 25 years we've really seen the tuition hikes um, increase. Right. And uh, we need to have more student, student loans. I mean, I had four part-time jobs in college. Right. And was able to come out with not a lot of debt from college. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, when you do have a lot of debt, it's, it's, it affects everything. Right. Um, and we want to encourage education, right. Right? not yes. saddle people with this tremendous debt that they then have to, to work their way out of. So right. it's one of the areas we really need to focus. I supported a group called K uh, California Rise, carise.org, um, which is, has a plan for free uh, tuition. So uh, there are ways to do it, and there are ways to fund it, and I'm happy to uh, talk more about that later. So uh, in California, you know, we are at a place in, in our growth as a state, and the population is growing to be quite substantial, like one of the most important countries in the world <laughs> yeah. as a state. Uh, and it does seem like, like the United States generally, that there's a need to invest in infrastructure. So for example, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure that your business has taken you to Europe and to Asia to travel, and there's like a much greater prevalence of subway systems and light yeah. rail and high-speed rail to connect between cities, and we have so little of that. So just like generally the investment in infrastructure um, and specifically about high-speed rail. What are your thoughts about that in California? Yeah, we need more investment. L.A. has recently committed $123 billion for mm -hmm. public transportation. Uh, Seattle, about $80 billion. Mm -hmm. We haven't done anything on that scale. So mm -hmm. we have a couple issues. We have 27 overlapping transit agencies. Right. So we can't coordinate schedules or mm -hmm. fares right. as they do yeah. in the places you talked about. Right. Um, but we also need a bigger investment. So I'll be doing an event with... Um, Supervisor Warren Slocum from San Mateo County right after this, and he's a big proponent of Dumbarton Rail. Mm. So ultimately there's more jobs in the in the west, more housing in the east. We need east-west transit. Yeah. And then we need to invest in the great separations here so we can have more Caltrain. With electrifying Caltrain, we're already going to have about 10% more. Right. But if we really want to have 30, 40, 50% more, if the plans to go from 65,000 riders to 180,000 riders, mm -hmm. that would be like adding three more lanes on 101. Right. And we can do it, um, but we need to fix the grade separations. We have 42 grade separations. We need to just get those done um, so that we can have um, turned Caltrain's really what it could be. Right. Well, that's a very good example of, of, of uh, uh, low-hanging fruit. You know, we yeah. have uh, the right-of-way and we have the yeah. lines and the stations and such. And, um, and what about the big projects like high-speed rail? <laughs> you, know, you must be asked that question. What's, what's your view about high-speed rail in terms of the governor's plan to build the backbone in the Central Valley and, and continue to work yeah. to build out other segments later? Well, you know, I ran, the last time I ran in 2010, I came a very close second mm. for the state assembly. And High speed rail was a big issue at that time, yeah, and I, already I really it. dove deep into the budget. And I just said, "This is um, this is not this business plan, this business model. Right. This is not reasonable. This is not going to work." Yeah. And sure enough, it's cost you know four or five, six times more than they even thought just to build this initial you know Shermer said to Bakersfield line. Right. So you know, unfortunately, and that's not even that's still diesel. So yeah. Um, there's issues with how, with how we went about it. Right. I do think ultimately connecting the valley to valley, the central valley to San Jose, right. that connection um, would be powerful. As I mentioned, 15 yeah. years on the board of UC Merced, um, we need to expand the Bay Area. People can say, okay, we almost, you know, say, wait, but there's too many jobs here, right? We, right. Um, we, why can't some of these companies locate a call center or something else, um, an engineering facility right. um, uh, further out? Um, and, and we need, the transportation network to to make that happen. So I think that connection, uh, high speed connection from San Jose to 
of the Central Valley would be worth pursuing. Right. Good. Um, there's a lot of questions recently in the area of housing and in some other areas about the balance of power between Sacramento and local communities. Yeah. And how do you think well, the state's? Been? Yes, exactly. <laughs> how do you think the state's doing in, in striking that balance, trying to create structure wh whereby it's easier to make housing on the one hand while respecting local control and local character? Um, uh, what is the? Um, how, how do you think we're doing so far? And, and what do you think of more recent proposals? Well, which way do we should be, be going on that? Yeah. We don't have a great track record of state preemption, you right. know, when the state has preempted um, uh, decision-making ability from, from the local um, uh, local governments. Mm -hmm. um, but so clearly we, we do need more housing. We need a massive investment of affordable housing. Right. Um, we need to uh, try to build that as near transit as possible right. um, so that we don't actually increase the, the traffic. Yes. And then we need to be creative, like in ways that I talked about, and use public land because um, that's the biggest cost right. um, of building yeah. affordable housing. Should we be um, investing in housing or should we be investing in public housing or more using public land to support nonprofit and other affordable housing? Well, I think it's, so you know, we lost redevelopment and that was a major right. source of money. We haven't caught up yet. So mm -hmm. we do need more money um, ultimately for to create that affordable housing. Right. Um, but yes, we also need to look creatively again at public land and other sources um, that or you know, underused um, land um, that we can can build some of that that housing, right. um, and but we do need to hold cities accountable as well, mm -hmm. right? We need to say cities with local control comes do your part, local right. responsibility, yeah. and we do need to to again you know use but I think both carrots uh, for sure and possibly if necessary we have some sticks on the table as well to hold cities accountable. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know you so tell us where you want to build the housing, yeah. but we, you know we do need some more housing, right? Uh, Josh, if viewers wanted to reach out to you about your campaign, uh, how, how should they contact you? Sure. Um, well, our website is joshbecker2020.com. Okay. Uh, email uh, josh at beckersenate2020.com. Okay. So josh at beckersenate2020.com. Very good. Well, yeah. um, uh, good luck as you continue on the campaign trail. I know that that's a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a big job. It's an important job. Thank you for running. And uh, thank you so much for um, this conversation. Thank you for having me here today. My pleasure, Josh. Thank you for watching DTV. Give us a call at 408-445-9500 or visit our website at www.sccdp.org. Help us to make a difference. We'll see you on the campaign trail.